The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Thank you, Shiraz. So when we talk about innovation and uh, precast pavement, everything in terms of innovation with precast is recent because the entire technology is only about 15 or 16 years old. But I'm going to mention some things, most of which are based upon the super slab system that we're involved with. So Shiraz showed you some slides that indicate that slots are needed to encase dowels. So no matter what system is used, there's a slot of some sort. Well, as you can imagine, slots do affect a precast slab. In fact, we have found that whenever we have any issues like a crack, it will typically or frequently emanate from a crack. So one of the things we've learned over time is, look, we're going to minimize or try to minimize the structural effect of those slots. And it's pretty obvious we make them smaller. So this does a few things. It reduces the potential for cracking, minimizes the grout, and leaves more concrete over the slots or under the slots, depending on which system we're talking about. And because there's more concrete, we have more room for reinforcing. So if we can make the slots smaller, then we gain on a couple of fronts. So the one thing that we have done in our system is try to lower the slots. Typically, historically, dowels are placed at the center of the slab. They do not have to be placed at the center of the slab. There's some uh, work done by Iowa State University, some publications out there. So on the slide at the left, you'll see that basically that's our old standard, uh, T over 2. That's where we place the dowels, and we place the slots to encase a center-located dowel. Our new standard is that we lower the dowel so that all of our slots, no matter how thick the slab is, is five and a half inches. That's our standard. So again, as I said, that leaves room for more concrete and steel over the slots. So another way to reduce the slot size is shorten up the dowels. Historically, the old standard in most states is that we use dowels that are 18 inches long, typically inch and a half, sometimes inch and a quarter, but usually they're 18 inches long. So new information out there, new research shows that we don't need 18 inch long slots, especially with precast slabs, because we know where that dowel is. One of the reasons why 18 inches was chosen as an old standard is that in slip form paving and fixed form paving, where dowels are placed in baskets, there's always a question of whether or not that joint got sawed in the center of those dowels. We don't have that situation with precast. We know where the joint is relative to the dowel, so therefore we can shorten a dowel. So that's the new trend that's happening in several of the states that we're working in. Another way that we can reduce slot size is to reduce the length of tie bars. And this is a big one. Tie bars, at least in New York State, many other states. By the way, I'm from New York, in case you were wondering. In New York, the standard dowel length is 18 inches long, so that means the slot is 19 inches long. As you can see on the photo on the left, looking up underneath one of our slabs along the right-hand edge, you'll see a series of tie bar slots of 19 inches long. That's our old standard. We have since, in the last few years, gone to a headed tie bar that's only 7 inches long. We've done testing to show that this is effective as a tie bar, and with those tie bars, we only need slots that are eight inches long. That's a big difference. We typically, on these so far, we've kept this tie bar at the center of the slab, although there's evidence to show that that can be lowered also. I'm understanding that in Germany, they actually keep the tie bar down about the middle third of the slab. But again, our agenda here is to reduce the effect of those slots. We've been doing this a number of years. It seems that we are doing more and more and more approach slabs. So along with that comes New situations, different geometry, more complex kind of approach labs. So what I'm showing here on the left is a approach lab that we did maybe four years ago or so. Very heavy skew, notice the geometry of those things. And by the way, those slabs were non-planar, they were warped. 
that is very common to encounter in a bridge approach slab. On the right hand side is the best picture I have of an approach slab that actually was installed on the approaches to the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City. Take a look at that puppy and all the haunching going on, the notch at the end, you can see a notch right there that was cast in the slab to accommodate a prefabricated joint system at the bridge. So not only was it haunched like that, but what you can't see from the picture, it was also skewed. This is like kind of demonstrating our motto at Fort Miller, if you can draw it, we can build it, we can set it. The trick is though, can we get it surveyed? That's the big trick. Okay, so a couple of new products I'll mention that kind of have enabled us to do some new things. One is a removable dowel system. If you take a look on the left-hand side, you'll see a dowel that's manufactured out of a, in this case, stainless steel grade 40 pipe, steel pipe basically. There's nuts cast in the end. So when we get that cast in this lab, we can remove that. I'll show you how that happens in a second. And the other thing that we have done is we've taken that tie bar that we talked about before, that headed tie bar, seven inches long, and rather than make this all one piece, we've made it two pieces and introduced a bar coupling or a threaded coupling and you'll see why we're doing that in a second. What this does, these two products basically enables us and really were necessary for us to make our slabs so that they were removable and replaceable. So here's a new acronym for you, RUP, Removable Urban Pavement. And we'll show you that this is really happening, designed primarily for utility intensive arterials in city streets. I have a slide to show you in a second. And also for a concept that we call smart patching. And I'll show you a few slides on that later on. Some pictures of utility intensive streets. Some of these are on First Avenue in New York City. This is very common. You probably don't have them in your city like this. But in New York City, sometimes you need an SUV to get across our intersections because of the way they have been repaired over the years. And they throw in there non-durable materials, poor load transfer, probably none at all, and poor workmanship on top of that. So what we had been asked to do, this is not something that we set out to invent. Actually, New York City DOT came to us and said, hey, you know, Donald Trump doesn't know everything. He doesn't know how to do intersections, so help us out with this here. So the concept here is to make precast slabs of various sizes, and when they need to do utility work, a broken water main, bad valve, then rather than just cutting a hole anywhere, then cut the dowels or cut the joints and remove it slab by slab as you need to to get down to do the utility work. That's what I'm demonstrating. We simply cut the dowels in this case, clean up the slab. In this case, we turn it over, clean it up, remove all the grout underneath it and in the slots and then restore the half dowels that we cut. We have them left back in the slab. So in this case, we actually extract, we take a bolt and thread it into that nut that we had welded in the back of that dowel, keep turning it, and it extracts that half dowel such that it happens to be the right size. We can insert a new dowel in that same location. Dowel restored. Okay, so now in terms of the tie bars, remember that we had a coupling on those headed tie bars. So what we did is we cut down through the coupling and in order to remove that coupling so we can screw on another coupling, we take a little core bit around the coupling, unscrew the half coupling that's in there, screw in a new coupling and we're off to the races. We have a new tie bar. So in this case you can see, barely see, replacement of a restored slab over restored dowels and restored tie bars. Rup. Renewable urban pavement. Is this weird or what? I mean, this is pretty far out there, right? Well, guess what? We are doing a job probably starting, I've been saying this now for about a year, but I think this is actually going to happen within the next month or so. Broadway Junction, Brooklyn, New York, Van Sinderen Avenue, and these are the slab layout drawings. You can see the utilities on each end. The city actually asked us to fabricate these slabs as a pilot project. Of the 167 slabs on this project, there are 75 that are flat and 76 that are non-planar. Some of the non-planar or warp slabs are warped up to an inch and three quarters. This is Vince Cinderin Avenue. Pretty bad. A lot of traffic, a lot of buses. There's a metro station there. And by the way, this is the very place that you use precast slabs. This is also the place where you use renewable 
precast slabs. So that'll be happening very shortly. Actually, we just got another job in Staten Island. That's even another country. We're going to be doing a series of 17 bus pads, and most of them are over utilities. So they will all incorporate these types of dowels. That brings this to a what I call smart patching. And basically, when Shiraz mentioned intermittent patching or intermittent installations, he really was talking about patching. Got a bad spot here, put a new slab in, bad spot over there, put three slabs in, whatever. But people have been kind of looking at that as some people, some states, well, that's just kind of temporary. We're going to replace the whole road in 10 years anyway, 15 years. How many times have you heard that story? I've been around long enough to go through a few of those cycles, and guess what? They never have enough money. So what this technology enables us to do is actually this. So in the first year, and again, we're going to add precast slabs on to precast slabs that were installed previously. I'm going to show a little case study or project is actually still not quite done. And this demonstrates what happens with smart patching. Basically, the red squares are slabs that were put in the first time, the first series of patching. On this particular highway that we're going to talk about, I-95 in New York City and the Bronx, actually, seven years later, which was last year, they had to do more repair. And guess what? They didn't have enough money to do the whole roadway. And guess what? They still had a lot of traffic, and it had to be done in five-hour work windows. So last year and this year, they put in the yellow squares. And notice that they joined up to the red squares. In 2021, I'm predicting, thereabouts, they're going to have to put in more slabs on the same highway. They still won't have enough money. They're still going to have a lot of traffic. So they're going to put in the blue squares. And so this dowel system enables them to easily add on to the precast slabs that were placed previously. This is a project. Apologize for the small scale of it, but you can see the various set of red and blue. There are different patterns there, but you can see that some were placed in 2007, and now some are being added on to in 2015. So last year, the New York State Thruway Authority that owns this highway made a decision. What they had to do last year to add onto slabs were replaced in 2007 because they were solid steel dowels. They had to remove a foot of the previously placed precast slabs, throw it away so they could epoxy anchor the new dowel and to add on to that particular patch. With a new system, they could put the dowel in. Originally, that's the removable dowel, the hollow dowel that I showed you earlier. When it comes time to add on to that pavement, then they simply cut it at the joint and replace it with a solid steel dowel. So they don't have to cut and throw away a good precast slab or a foot of it that's going to last for another 30 years or so. So it's a concept we call smart patching. Why is it smart? Because it saves about $800 per joint. That is for a, in this particular case, again, for this particular job, these were the numbers. With eight dowels in the joint, it saved about $800 per joint. This is kind of an overview for a upcharge, of course. Nothing comes for nothing, so there was an upcharge for these dowels. They paid it and installed them. So in 2021, if they only replace 13, 14% of those joints, they're saving $340,000. For an investment on the upper right-hand side of $257,000, they're saving three hundred and forty. dollars If you keep going down that table, if they replace a slab, which they probably eventually will, or add on to every one of those joints, they're going to realize a savings of almost $2.5 million. That's over the expense of $257,000. So this makes a lot of economic sense. We're seeing another project in New York, possibly two, that will be using the system in this coming year. Mr. Ross showed some pictures of this job, actually. This was a project where we replaced, I think it was like five or six intersections over a length of about eight miles of Rockaway Boulevard. And these are aerial views of what Shiraz showed you. Basically what it is, it's full depth replacement of existing asphalt intersections because they were rutted so badly. This was all done at night, by the way, eight hour work windows. As you can see some of the geometry in terms of curves, turning lanes, all done in the precast slabs, and also many of those slabs were warped. This has kind of taken on another dimension, and that is a need in many places, rather than doing full depth replacement, to do partial depth replacement. So this project is going to be happening this year in Toronto. I'm understanding we're going to do an August installation. So you can see the amount of traffic here. We're talking about heavy duty. 
When you start talking about 341,000 vehicles a day, 374,000 vehicles a day, that's a lot of traffic. That causes a lot of rutting. A big percentage of that is trucks. Especially on the 401, they have to mill and fill about every five or six years. So they're going to try this. This particular section of highway, they're going to mill out, again, eight hour work window, go in there at 10 o'clock at night, mill out nine inches or 10 inches of the existing asphalt highway. It's very thick at that point. And then put a new precast slab in over a series of a few nights, basically replace it with precast slab. So that's hardening up the surface of asphalt pavement. A new frontier, I'm thinking that this is going to be an exciting frontier for precast pavement technology. So here's another thing that we did recently. These slabs were actually made for a acid battery recycling plan. The original plan is only a few years old, put concrete down, and because of the sulfuric acid, the floor didn't last more than five years. So they had us make these slabs made out of polymer concrete. Think about that. So what you're looking at basically is polymer concrete, and this is the mixing of it. It's a very different procedure and operation, but this is something to keep in mind that can be done should you have need of it. Okay, so this is another little wrinkle that may come into play. We've done a few of these, actually, precast way in motion. This was actually installed on I-95 in Upper Manhattan, again in the middle of the night. So take a look at the fabrication and all the stuff that goes into these slabs is incredible. But when that goes in place overnight, the only thing that we have to do is, there's a conduit here and they just thread some conductors, some wires through there, so this becomes a plug-and-play installation. This did go in overnight, by the way, so at 6 o'clock in the morning, traffic was using these new slabs. I don't think it was weighing at that time, but it was installed. Another thing that we've been doing more and more of is instrumenting precast slabs. This is a project we did actually a few years ago, maybe in 2006 or 2008, 2006, I think. Basically, open road tolling treadle that were actually encased in the precast slabs, and they went in overnight, wires hanging out the end, and a couple of nights later, they were plugged in and they were ready to go, and they were working in conjunction with this equipment on top of the roadway. So that's open road tolling. There's more and more of that being done. We're doing more and more of that, let's put it that way. This kind of opens up the door, and you're going to start hearing about some things of making precast charging panels for charging cars with electric batteries. Well, that's something new. There's been some of that done in research in Holland and Far East as well. Some discussion and research now, particularly for airports, runways, taxiways, to make panels that can be heated so they can melt the ice in the snow. And last but not least, and this is kind of way far out there, is incorporating solar generating cells and precast panels that I can say we have not done it. I think it's far out there, but that's being talked about. So that's really all my presentation. If anybody has any questions, there's some contact information for you and more information at this website.